Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, um, let the, the song we just sang be our prayer. Lord, set your church on fire and re revive us and heal the street and the land. And Lord, this song is particularly relevant in the midst of pandemic. And Lord, uh, we need your healing physically, emotionally. We need your deliverance spiritually. And Lord, many of us are uh, struggling uh, physically, emotionally uh, because of this um, COVID. And Lord, we first of all, thank you uh, because you are the king who sits on the throne. You are sovereign. Your faithfulness never wavers and your love endures forever. And we thank you for being our God. And we thank you for being a loving God. We know that all the good gifts are from you, Lord. You never change. And for that, we thank you. Even though we may be struggling physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. And Lord, we, we know and we acknowledge and we proclaim that your sovereignty prevails and that your love endures forever and that your faithfulness lasts through generations. Lord, uh, tomorrow is Yom Kippur, the atonement day. And Lord, uh, you are the ultimate atonement for our sin, Lord Jesus. You are the Passover lamb who redeems the sin of the mankind. We give you all the thanks. Because of you, we have hope. And Lord, we pray for our uh, Jewish friends, neighbors, and give us opportunity to share the gospel of Christ with them so that they know that the ultimate atonement is Christ Jesus. And through him, we are delivered from the sin into light and into your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I also pray for um, those who are still struggling with uh, physical illness. And Lord, we ask for your healing power to be upon them. And Lord, we acknowledge you are the ultimate healer and that uh, you never stop healing us. And even, yeah, every second, every minute of our life is sustained by your word, by your power. And we acknowledge that your power is sufficient for those who are struggling physically to overcome the sickness. Help us, God. And Lord, as we... Um, wanted to build this English ministry into a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church. Uh, Lord, I pray that your love fill this community so that we can be uh, the kingdom on earth to manifest your light. Lord, we need your help. Uh, this is not by our flesh and blood that we can do this. And we invite your presence. We invite your Holy Spirit to fill us just like Ephesians, the fullness of Christ fill us. As we continue to pray, praise you and to worship you, please anoint your servant Fong and uh, give him your word to preach. And we need your uh, presence here. Please be with us. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Jack, for that. Very much needed. Good morning, sisters and brothers. As I will say every week, it is great. It is wonderful to be here and to see all of you online today. And I hope that this worship together truly finds you well. And if not, and I hope that through this worship, worship time together, that God will continue to encourage and strengthen you. 
and all of us together. Now, before we go any further, as many of you, many of you may know, this month, so far, we have been going through the book of First Corinthians. Going through a little bit, piece by piece, chapter by chapter. And today, we will continue, continue our journey through 1 Corinthians, as there are many, many issues that the Corinthian church struggled and wrestled with, that even for us, this church, can also learn from, and we too also struggle with as well. Now, before we go any further into 1 Corinthians, I want to go ahead and read the passage for us one time through, and then we will dive into it. So please, if you have your Bibles with you, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We will begin in verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. And it reads, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision counts for anything. But keeping the commandments of God counts. Each one should remain in the condition in which he, he or, and she was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men and women. So sisters and brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let them remain there with God. Let's pray. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, we come before you, and first of all, I just want to thank you for all these sisters and brothers online today. It is a encouragement for myself, and I hope and pray for everyone else. Lord, we come before you, and we ask that during this time, may you please, please lead us to a place of surrender, to a place of, 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 of setting aside and letting go all of our concerns, our stress, to let it go at your feet, God, to trust to trust that all of these things are under your jurisdiction, God. There is nothing in this world, nothing in all of creation that exceeds you, God. So please, during this time, teach us to surrender to you. Whatever the stress, the trial, the struggles may be, teach us to surrender it to you. Lord, we come before you and we ask that you please lead us now. Holy Spirit, lead us through your word. May this be the starting point. May this reorient and lead us to a posture of obedience, to a posture of truly living our life in Christ. Bring us back to yourself, God, for we are prone. We are likely to wander away. Lord, it is during this time that we trust, Lord, that we all come here under your name and we know that you're with us. Please, recalibrate us back to yourself, that we may begin anew in obedience and in our life in Christ with one another and in you, Jesus. 
Open our hearts, open our eyes today. Please lead us to cast aside any, any and all distractions. For truly, Lord, if we find ourselves distracted during this time, may you please discipline us. May you please show us that our distractions simply reveal what is really on our hearts, what we are really searching for. Whatever the case may be, we trust that this time is edifying for each individual and for this church as a whole. In all this, we surrender unto you, trusting that you are leading and guiding us now. In your name, in authority, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So as we begin to dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 17, I just want to do a quick, quick recap of what we've already been preaching about these past couple of weeks. Now, if you remember, two weeks ago, when Alex Chen was here, or at least online, he preached in 1 Corinthians 5, speaking about the sexual immorality within the Corinthian church and the importance of church membership and church discipline within that context. And then challenging and encouraging all of us to emphasize in our church membership and discipline as well, to have that accountability. For we know that even the sin of sexual immorality is pervasive, not just in our country, but even amongst believers and even amongst our congregation. Following after that, last week, I, I preached on 1 Corinthians 6, beginning verse 12 through 20, speaking more specifically about how the Corinthian church truly believed in the Greek philosophy, the Greek way of life. They believed in the sense of dualism, the separation of the physical and the spiritual. And many of, of the Corinthian believers also believed that their bodies doesn't matter. All that matters is their spirituality. All that matters is their mind. Therefore, the Corinthian church in chapter 6 was engaged in, in, in sexual immorality with prostitutes. Because they said the body doesn't mean anything. God is going to destroy it one day. Therefore, let's just do whatever we want. But it is in that, in that, in that chapter and verses that, that Apostle, Paul, Apostle Paul truly disciplines them. And he says, actually, you belong to God. And your body is good. Because if Jesus physically resurrected, guess what? Your body will also be physically resurrected, assuming you are a true believer. That one day your body will be physically resurrected. Therefore, your body does matter. You, I, the church, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, stated in chapter 6. And it was in that context that I tried to show how all of us are constantly in that battle between spirituality and the physical, how we constantly also separate the physical and, and, the, physical and the spiritual, because we also are influenced by the Greek dualism. And today, we will begin to see how that lie begins to also take more form, more shape within the Corinthian church. Now, as you see in chapter 7 here, I'm beginning in verse 17. So I'm skipping verses 1 through 16, but I'm going to recap it for you. Because it is important. And it is this, that following after chapter 6, after Paul rebukes them, now, Paul attacks another slogan, another, another saying that the Corinthian church had, which was this. I'm going to read it for us in verse 1. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, quote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, end quote. Now, that quote was a slogan. It was a theme for the Corinthian church's life. And if, if you're paying attention, you would notice that that, that quote is pretty contradictory to the last half of chapter 6. Because in chapter 6, they were sleeping around with prostitutes. And now, why do they say in chapter 7, verse 1, that man should not have sexual relations with a woman? And vice versa. Why is that? It seems pretty contradictory that the Corinthian church was living this double standard. But as we go on further to see in the, in the first half of chapter 7 here, 
in a nutshell. The Corinthians were, were, were trying to create this, this idea of, of, of being spiritual. Because, again, they, they believed in the separation of physical and spiritual. And so in order to, to, to look like they are spiritual, in order to look like they believe in God, in order to show that they are spiritual, these Corinthians looked at their life and they said, hmm, what can we do in this life that will show that we are more unique, we are more spiritual, we are more, more just in tune with God, more than anyone else? And the Corinthians said, well, let's just not get married. Let's just not have sex. When we don't get married, when we don't have sex, that equals being spiritual. And that was the mindset of the Corinthian believers. And to us, that may sound a bit ridiculous, but the Corinthian believers truly wanted to show that their physical doesn't matter and their spiritual side, their mindset is all that matters. And they wanted to show that by being different from the world, by being different from other Christians. And so in, in trying to be different, in trying to be set apart, the Corinthians actually started to, to attack marriage, to attack sex within marriage. And it's here that Apostle Paul says, actually, Corinthians, you're wrong. Just because you say that you're a Christian and you're more spiritual, and therefore you don't have sex, you don't, you don't get married, you stay unmarried, that doesn't mean you're more spiritual, Corinthians. Even though you, Corinthians, are trying to look more spiritual, you're trying to be more spiritual according to your own standards and your Greek culture, you're not actually spiritual at all. If anything, you're hurting yourself, and you're disparaging God's creation. And it is at this point that we arrive here in verse 17. And after all of this is said and done, after Paul disciplines the Corinthian church about attacking marriage and attacking sex in marriage, and how they want to look spiritual by not doing any of these things at all, this is what Apostle Paul says to them. For many of the Corinthians believe that, oh, I become a Christian now, but the problem is I'm married. And so to show that my life is different, I'm going to get a divorce. That shows me that, oh, I, I'm a Christian, I used to be married, but now I'm spiritual. So now I get a divorce to show, that, to show how spiritual I am. This is the thinking of the Corinthians. The Paul says, no. No, that is wrong. That is not what being spiritual means, Corinthians. And this is what Paul says. Let us begin in verse 17. And I am reading from the ESV. Verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to them and to which God has called them. This is my rule in all the churches. We see here that Paul summarizes everything he said in verse 1 through 16 in this sentence. Lead the life in which you are called. And the key focus here is called. Called. Essentially, Paul is saying, hey, Corinthians, when God called you, when you first came to know God, when you first came to know Christ, and know the Father and have the Holy Spirit, what kind of position in life were you in? Were you married? Were you unmarried? Were you old? Were you young? Were you healthy? Were you sick? What kind of position were you in, Corinthians? In what circumstances surrounded your first calling to Christ? And here calling would be interpreted as when the moment where, where the Corinthians truly surrendered, truly put their faith, and truly followed Christ and obeyed the Father's will to live by the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, obviously, they were living in certain circumstances. So, for example, for myself, when, when I first truly felt the call, what were my circumstances? And yours may be similar and different. But for me, at that time, I was 18. That's when I truly felt the call. That's when my faith was truly in Christ. That's when I truly believed. Even though growing up in a Christian environment, all those years, I didn't believe until I was 18. So what was the circumstances surrounding my calling? I was 18. 
going to college, going to work, living away from my parents, living with my uncles. Those were, that was, those were the circumstances surrounding my initial calling. And today, it's a little bit different. I'm here with you all. And for you, I would challenge you. Think about your own circumstances in your calling. Now hold that. Keep that in mind. As we go a little bit deeper about what, what does Paul mean when he says, stay in your calling? What does that mean? So whatever your circumstances of, of your faith in Christ is, wherever you are, school, work, family, traveling, whatever it is, keep that in the back of your mind. So let's dive deeper into this passage, and we will see and explore a bit more what Paul means to stay in your calling. So let's continue. Verse 18. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek, un, let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God counts. So in Paul trying to better explain what he means in verse 17, he uses the example of circumcision. Now keep in mind, at this time, the Apostle Paul was speaking to many Corinthians who were largely non-Jewish. However, Paul uses the, the, the uh, circumcision illustration to truly, because that was a really big deal in, in Jewish, in Judaism, and it still is today for many people who are practicing Judaism. Now, if you don't know what circumcision is, it goes back specifically to Genesis 17. For God uh, is speaking to Abraham. And, and, and Abraham was counted righteous first. As it says in Romans 4. And then God gave Abraham the physical sign of circumcision. It was an outward sign of Abraham's inward faith and righteousness in God. And for many people who practice Judaism back then and even today, circumcision is like the sign. It's what like makes you righteous. It's what like makes you a Jewish person. Circumcision is that is that significant for, for the Juda Judaistic world. And yet here Paul says circumcision doesn't mean anything. And on top of that, circumcision was also one of the big problems in the early church, where many Jewish Christians were saying, Oh, you you non Jewish Christians, you need to get circumcised in order to become Christian. Because we Jewish Christians, we're all circumcised because we continue, the, we continue what Abraham did and we continue Abraham's righteousness. So you non-Jewish Christians, you have to get circumcised to be a Christian. So you see, this whole idea of circumcision was a really, really big deal. And this is more of a problem in the book of Galatians. But Corinthians doesn't get too much into that debate. However, I say that to just, to just try to bring out the proportion of, of, of this, this the situation of circumcision. The circumcision was deemed, at least the corrupt understanding of it, was deemed as the sign of spirituality, the sign of righteousness, that if you are circumcised, you are righteous. If you are circumcised, you are spiritual. And if you're not, sorry, you're unrighteous and you're not spiritual. Again, which is why the Jewish Christians were forcing it upon the, the non-Jewish Christians. And yet here, Paul says, hey, guess what, guys? Circumcision doesn't mean anything. Uncircumcision doesn't mean anything. Think of it like this. I know circumcision, we speak of it, might be hard for us to understand the, the weight and the significance of it, but think of it like this. If someone asks you today, hey, do you want to go on a, do you want to go on a missions trip? Come on, let's go on a mission trip. Don't you want to be spiritual? Don't you want to experience God uh, in another part of the world? Come be spiritual with me. Let's go, let's go on a mission trip. Let's go help people. Let's go preach the gospel in another world, in another country. So come on, let's go. And if you're anything like me, I've been on a couple mission trips. And I remember when I went, yeah, in, in those moments, there were times where you did feel this emotional spiritual, like, high. And you're kind of like, wow, I feel so great. I feel that God is here. 
I feel like God is moving. I feel like God is working. And, like, you know, I have to, cut, I have to fly, you know, 1,500 miles to get here. But you know what? It's okay. Because now I truly feel connected with God. Now I truly feel spiritual because I'm on this mission trip. And I remember so many times coming back home and people asking me about the mission trip. And I, I was just going on and on and on about it. And I can see the look on, on, on people's faces. And I, I, can, I can read it. I can read the look on their faces. And, and it, it went something like this, like, wow, Fong, you sound so spiritual. You went on this great mission trip overseas. You experienced God. You saw God. Wow, Fong, you are spiritual. You sound like a real Christian. Or how about some of us who, who have been to conferences or retreats? where they have this, like, you know, really, like, good music and, like, good speaker and, like, you know, fun stuff to do, and you're just, like, away from society. You're just, like, in the jungle or in the woods or something, and you can, like, just focus. You can just, like, hear your thoughts. You can just hear God. And, then, and as they're playing the music and as they're saying, all right, guys, come do the altar call. Come rededicate your life to God. How many times have you felt that, that pull, that emotional post in you to go and rededicate your life to God? How many have you felt that, that spiritual high? And then when you come back from those retreats or, or conferences, you're just like, you're just, your head is just above the clouds. You're just like, wow, this is so amazing. I just experienced this great thing. I feel so spiritual right now. And yet a couple weeks later, that feeling is gone. Sisters and brothers, I say this to make the point. Today, listen to me. Today, you and I, this Christ, Western Christian culture we live in, we still do the same thing the Corinthians do. We still look at things in the Christian bubble, and we try to make that the marker, the definition of spirituality. Today, it's not the circumcision for us. Today, it's, it's mission trips. Today, it's conferences and retreats. Today, it's street evangelism. Today, it's fasting. Sisters and brothers, these things are not bad. They're not bad. They are good as spiritual discipline. They are good as the expression of your faith, but they are not the, the sole vehicle. The, the, the very, they're not the very source of your spirituality. Many times today, sisters and brothers, we still act the same way as the Corinthians. We still believe that, oh, if, if I don't go on a mission trip, if I don't go on a retreat, if I don't, if I don't preach the gospel on the street, I'm not spiritual. If I don't do these three simple acts, then I'm just not a spiritual person. And that's not good. I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to be spiritual. So many times, reluctantly, we end up doing these things, whether we wanted to or not. And in the same way, sisters and brothers, that, that the Jewish people define spirituality, define righteousness as the physical sign of circumcision, we do that today except we use other, other things and we label it as spiritual. That if you want to be spiritual, you go on a mission trip. If you want to be spiritual, you need to go preach the gospel on the street to, to random strangers. And many times when, 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 when we paint Christianity in that way, we can start to make other people, and even ourselves, we can feel like, well, my life is not spiritual because I'm not constantly going to mission trips. I'm not constantly talking to random strangers about Jesus. Maybe I'm just not spiritual. Maybe there's something wrong with me. And sisters and brothers, today, in God's word, similar to the Corinthians and circumcision and how they thought that was spirituality and how they, they equal that physical act of circumcision to spirituality, today we do the same thing with equaling some things like mission trips, things like conferences and retreats, we equal that to be spirituality. And if we believe that, we are on a very dangerous path. Again, conferences, retreats, mission conferences, they're not bad. But just like circumcision, those activities should only be an expression of your pre-existing faith. Those activities should not give you your faith. Those activities should not, should not be, be the definition of your faith. 
They're not the picture of your spirituality, no. Just like circumcision, we should only do those things out of faith. If we don't have faith, I would highly, highly recommend not doing those things. Because then you're just doing things in vain. You're blaspheming who God is. You're mocking God and his works. That truly our spirituality is, is more than just what we do. It's more than just a physical sign. True spirituality in Christ, by the Holy Spirit, it's more than that. And this is what Apostle Paul is trying to get with the Corinthians. He's saying, hey, guys, it's not about the physical sign. I know you're trying to be spiritual. I know you want to show that to the world, and that's great. But it's not about marriage. It's not about circumcision. It's not about any of these things, brothers and sisters. That's not what makes you spiritual. We need to be very, very careful there. Because the moment some Christians say, oh, I've never been on a mission trip. I've never served in church. I've never preached. I never teach. I never led small group. And then all of a sudden, we're like, oh, okay. So how are you spiritual again? Sisters and brothers, we need to be very careful. Lest we fall into the same trap as the Corinthians always trying to, to take these spiritual disciplines and try to make it the, the example, the definition of spirituality, and it is not. Again, it can be a spiritual discipline, which is good, to strengthen and to exercise your faith, but it should not be the foundation of your faith. And so if you've ever felt that way, I know I've already talked to a couple of people who felt that way, that they felt that pressure from church, that if they don't go to mission trips, if they don't go to conferences, then they're bad Christian. They're not spiritual. I've talked to people like that, and even some within this church. They felt that pressure. They, 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 they felt that, like, just unrealistic expectations and a false definition of spirituality. And sister and brothers, if you, if you feel like that right now, if you have felt like that in the past, Continue to listen up to the word of God today. Moving on, as, as Paul continues to explain, what does he mean by living in the calling? Now we know that it's not, about, it's not about one or two activities. That is the definition of being spiritual. No, that's not the purpose of what it means to live in your calling today. So what does Paul mean? And so next, he, he goes a little bit further, and he uses another illustration, and he says this, verse 21. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, please do so. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a free person of the Lord. Similarly, he who was free when called is also a bondservant of Christ. You are bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of humanity. Now, in this case, Paul uses another example to, to explain, verse 17, to explain what he means by live where you are called. And, and in this case, when he talks about bond servant, in other words, slaves, we need to be very careful here. I understand that being living in the U.S., uh, we have this, this uh, bad experience, this bad taste with slavery, but we need to be very clear here. When Paul's here when, in the Corinthians, when he speaks of bond servant or slavery, He's not talking about the type, the kind of slavery that, that was in U.S. U.S. history. Okay, he's not talking about African chattel slavery. That's a very specific kind of slavery. Okay, it's called chattel slavery. That's not normal in in other parts of the world. Slavery in general was normal, but not that specific kind of slavery that the U.S. did. All right, the kind of slavery that Paul is talking about here is the slavery that existed in, in the Greek and the Roman time period. Again, the kind of slavery that Paul is speaking of here is not the U.S. history slavery, but it's the Greek and Roman kind of slavery. And what that means is, is during this time uh, in the Greek and Roman world, you were, if, uh, there was a lot of limitations on resources. It wasn't like living in, in the U.S. today where food is plentiful, where resources are plentiful. But living in the, world, uh, in the ancient world, in the Greek and Roman world, resources are very scarce. And so for you as a person to survive, 
uh, you you would have to pledge your your allegiance, your loyalty, your your life, pretty much, to another wealthy person who had more resources, and you would call that person your master. However, and, and you would be known as their slave. But it's not a slave. Again, it's not a slavery like U.S. history slavery, but it's a slavery more so that you you have access to your master's resources, including food, shelter, protection, reputation. But in turn, you as a slave, you belong to the master, and you represent your master. You are an extension of your master, essentially. And so we see here that, that, that when, when, in First Corinthians, when it talks about slavery, it's more so talking about uh, and yes, during this time, there were people in the church who were slaves, who did have a master, who, who they worked for, their employer, basically, who they represented, who they, they uh, you know, used their master's resources, all these things. And they, they did the master's bidding, they did the master's work, and things, like, things of that nature. So in the Corinthian church, there were slaves in that sense. They weren't free person. And free person basically just means, oh, like, you, don't, you don't work for anyone. You don't use anyone's resources. You don't... You don't belong legally to anyone and you don't represent anyone you just represent yourself and so in, in that context paul is saying to to the to the church that hey i understand that if you become a christian corinthian you might want to say hey i don't want to be a slave anymore now that i'm a christian i don't want to be a slave so let me be free or hey i'm a christian now i i have slaves now i want to let the slaves go because i'm a christian now Again, remember, it's slavery, not the same as U.S. history. I, got, I have to constantly repeat that because I understand that the, in the world we live in, when we say slavery, we automatically assume U.S. history slavery. And again, that's not the case in, in the Bible, all right? We need to be clear. But the point Paul is making here when he talks about slavery is this. When you become a Christian and you look at your life circumstances and there's situations that, 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 are, that are not fluid, situations that are more fixed, Situations that, that are very slow and difficult to change, such as being a slave, or such as owning slaves. Because of course, all of that would jeopardize your, your whole you know, business, wealth, and economics. And so Paul is saying this, essentially. He's saying, hey, when you become a Christian Corinthian, you don't need to free yourself of being a slave. You don't need to let go of your slaves. But of course, Paul has a side note and says, well, if you could be free, you should be free. Because, of course, no one wants to live a, a whole life of slavery, in that sense. But the point that Paul is making here is still the same. And no matter what situation you are in, whether it, you chose it, or whether you are under it, under, whether you are in that situation because of you didn't have a choice, whatever the case is, Corinthians and EMC3, continue to live in your calling. When Paul says, hey, even if you are free, guess what? You are still a slave to Christ. Even if you are a slave to, to a, a person, guess what? You are free in Christ. You see, Paul switches these two analogies here. It doesn't matter if you're legally free. You're still a slave to Christ. It doesn't matter if you're legally a slave. You are still free in Christ. You see how Paul switches this shit. And the reason why is this. To show you that to be, a, to be a believer, to be a Christian, it's not about getting yourself out of these situations in order to feel spiritual. It's not about trying to break all, all of the situations that you are involved in to, be, to feel spiritual. For example, for many of us who, who go to work, right, a lot of times we can, we can go to work and we can be like, oh, man, like, you know, the weekend was great. I saw, I saw brothers and sisters in Christ. I went to church. I read the Bible. I did this and this, this. I feel so spiritual. But now I have to go back to work for five days. And now I don't feel spiritual at all. I wish, I wish that I could just maybe just take a little break from work and, you know, just uh, be able to pray more, be able to read my Bible more, be able to, you know, do this or that more so that I can feel more spiritual even when I'm at work. Because working, in that sense, is a situation that, that is very difficult to, to change and uh, very essential to living in this world. Similarly, for many students out there, sometimes when you go to school, you're just like, oh man, why am I learning this? It doesn't feel like it's helping my life. Uh, and I definitely don't feel like I'm being spiritual right now. I'm just learning about economics, 
I'm just learning about speech. I'm just learning about math or science or literature. It doesn't feel like it has anything to do with God. It doesn't feel spiritual at all. So sometimes even as students, you can be tempted to, to think that, you know, if I could only be a student in like a private Christian school, or if I could only be a student and learn some Bible or learn this or learn that, maybe I can feel more spiritual. But I'm stuck in this fixed situation. You see, I use these two examples because this is probably the most common uh, way of life that we are living right now, whether we're working or we're in school. But sisters and brothers, if, if we feel this way, if we feel like we're not spiritual at work because we're just focused on this work, if we feel like we're not spiritual in school because we're just focusing on a curriculum, Apostle Paul says the same thing to you, same thing to me. Not about slavery per se, but about situations that are fixed. The slavery in this sense, in Paul's day, was fixed. And similarly, situations today, like work and school, are also fixed. It, it's slow to change in our lives. And because of that, Paul still says, hey, guess what? Even if you're legally free, you're still a slave to Christ. Even if you are legally a slave, you're still free in Christ. And in the same way, sisters and brothers, to live in our calling where we are, to be spiritual where we are, is to just continue to go to work, continue to go to school. You don't need to quit. You don't need to become a pastor. You don't need to go to Bible college. You don't need to do this or do that to feel like your, your work or your, or your education is more spiritual. That even when you do go to work, even when you do go to school, guess what? You are already committing a spiritual act. First of all, who created work? God. Back in Genesis 2, when God put Adam in the garden to work and keep the garden. Work is a good thing, and it is a spiritual thing. Likewise, education, wisdom, knowledge. Who is the God of wisdom? Who is the God of knowledge? The God of the Bible. And yet he, he allows you and I to learn these things so that we can better worship God. We can better know God. We can better know how small we are, how limited our little brains are. And how wise and how powerful, how knowledgeable God is. You see, sisters and brothers, when Paul is talking to the Corinthians here, he is saying, don't be so obsessed. Don't be so, you know, fixed on your situation that you can't change. Just because you say, oh, God, if, if only I could do something else in life, then I would be more spiritual. Then I would feel more spiritual. And Paul says, no, actually, stay where you are. Continue to be a slave. Continue to be a master. Because guess what? Either way, you're still serving Christ. And if this is your first time hearing this, think about it like this. Think about all the times in Scripture, in the, in the Gospels, where Jesus uses, Jesus uses parables or analogies. And what are the primary things that Jesus uses? What are the primary, the primary illustrations that Jesus uses? Normal, everyday things. Sisters and brothers, when Jesus speaks in the Gospels, he uses normal, everyday things to illustrate his point. He speaks about farmers. He speaks about fishermen. He speaks, he speaks about kings. He speaks about soldiers. Think about that. Jesus, even Jesus uses normal, everyday things to teach people. Meaning that that work, that, that kind of life, it's not bad. And just because you live in that life that's not explicitly talking about God or talking about Jesus, it doesn't mean it's not spiritual. That in actuality, the definition of spiritual in itself simply means that, that you interact, you live in the physical world. You're interacting with every physical being and every physical thing. You live in that world with purpose and with meaning. That is the definition of spirituality. Again, the definition of spirituality is you live in, the, in this physical world with meaning and purpose. When I talk to you, meaning and purpose. When I take care of a dog, meaning and purpose. When I go garden, meaning and purpose. When I eat, meaning and purpose. Everything. That's what it means to be spiritual. The secular is the opposite of that. Secular means there's nothing. There's just the physical. There's nothing behind the physical. The physical is just the physical. There's nothing there. But the difference here is that in Christianity, when you follow Christ, the spiritual is even deeper than that. It's not just 
meaning and purpose in the physical parts of life, but more importantly, how the physical parts of life point you to God and teach you about God. Because if God is the one who created everything. If you read Colossians 1, 15, 17, this was the theme verse for last, last school year, TG. Colossians 1, 15, 17 talks about how everything was created in and through, for, and by Christ. Everything was created in, through, for, and by Christ. Colossians 1, 15, 17. And if that is true, then that means everything in the created world has a, a, a fingerprint of, of, of Christ. And if that is true, then that means that we can trace all of created things back to God and know God through the created thing. Assuming Colossians 1, 15, 17 is true. You see, sisters and brothers, at the end of all of this, when Apostle Paul says, again, I'm going to read for us, and he actually says it three times, verse 17, verse 20, and lastly, verse 24. And I'm just going to read verse 24. So brothers and sisters, in whatever condition each was called, let him and her remain there with God. Brothers and sisters, being a believer, we need to be very careful of making the same mistakes as the Corinthians who try to spiritualize things. They're trying too hard. They're trying, to fit a, they're trying to fit a square cube into a circle-shaped hole. It's not going to work. No matter how hard you force it, it's not going to fit. And you know, for all of our efforts to, quote-unquote, spiritualize things in this life, we're doing it in vain. Because, brothers and sisters, everything in this world is already spiritual. We don't need to force it to be spiritual. It's just too many times we are the ones who are seeking something that the definition of spiritual, our definition of spiritual doesn't match with scripture, doesn't match with God's definition, which is why so many times we just go off and we seek our own experiences with no attention to scripture, no attention to church history, no attention to the church at all. But you see here, Paul says to the Christians, stay where you are. As a Christian, stay where you are, wherever you work, stay where you are, wherever you go to school, stay where you are. Every single thing you do, stay where you are. Because the light shines the brightest in the darkness. The light shines the brightest in the darkness. It's not about, it's not about moving into this little spiritual you know, pocket of, of people and just being isolated from the world and say, oh, yeah, we are spiritual because we don't talk or don't associate with the world. No, that's not what it means to be spiritual. But in this case of Paul saying, stay in your calling. Essentially, after these two examples of circumcision, of spiritualizing physical acts, and of, of, of staying in your fixed, your fixed circumstances in life, Paul is saying this. What it means to stay in your calling is this. Wherever, wherever Christ has called you from, when you first seriously and wholeheartedly surrender to him, whatever situation that is, stay there, serve there, be the light, be the salt there. Because guess what? For me, I cannot reach everyone. For all the schools you go to, all the jobs you work, I cannot reach those people. But you all can. So stay where you are. Don't think that just because you didn't go to a conference that you're not spiritual. Don't believe that just because you're, you're, you're working this job and you're not like being a missionary or something, you're not spiritual. No. No, that is false. That is a false dichotomy of spirituality and the physical. And this is where Paul says, hey, Corinthians, and hey, EMC3, stay where you are, where your calling is. Because guess what? It is when you go to work. It is when you go to school in the normal course of life. Okay, then you can truly live, exercise, and fulfill your calling. Not when you go overseas, unless that's your calling. Not when you stay within the church, unless that's your calling. But for the majority of people, they are called to be out in the world, to be working side by side with non-believers and with believers. So that they can show the world who God is. Brothers and sisters, our spiritual act of worship is this. I'm going to read it to us. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That is Romans 12, 1. Brothers and sisters, I don't know how else to make it even more clear to you. Let us be very careful of making the same mistakes as the Corinthians. That this letter, this first Corinthians letter was written for a purpose. That even through this, Holy Spirit speaking through Apostle Paul to the Corinthians and to us. To not put God in a box. To not put Christian spirituality in a box. But to see the whole world as our spiritual playground, so to speak. You see the whole world, everything we do. Whether we participate in family, go to work, go to school, take a vacation, whatever you do. See all of it as spiritual in the sense that you are doing it for God's glory. You are doing it to show God to other people. That is what it means to be spiritual. That is what it means to be a Christian. But we don't separate our lives. We don't separate the physical and the spiritual lives. But it's one. It is one life. And that was ultimately modeled and displayed for us in Christ when he united the physical and the spiritual together in himself. So sisters and brothers, today as you go out, whether just online school or online work or whether physical, whatever it is, as you spend time with your family, your friends, know that every single thing, you are exactly where you need to be. Be careful of wishing that you are in a more quote-unquote spiritual situation. Because if you, if you believe that, if you wish that, and I would, again, recommend you to read 1 Corinthians 7 here. Because here Paul is saying, stay where you are called. Because where you are called is where you will shine God's light. Where you are called is where you can live your spiritual act of worship. And that we do not need to force or try to spiritualize things in this life because this life in itself is already spiritual. It is just many times it is us who are blind or it is us who, who manipulate ourselves to only seek certain signs, to seek certain definitions. So really, it is us who is fooling ourselves. But if you would just be still, if you would just listen to God, if you would just read his word, seek God, you would know everything in this world. Everything. Is already a spiritual act of worship. In and through the physical to the spiritual, and through the, through the spiritual to the physical, it is our spiritual act of worship. So from here on out, let us be careful of making the same mistakes as the Corinthians of this separation of spiritual and physical. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word. I would come before you and we confess so many times we so many times we, we don't think about you, God. We think that when we go to school and we go to work and we're 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 with our family, like all of these all of these things are not spiritual because we're not at church, because we're not explicitly reading the Bible or talking about you, God. Therefore it's not spiritual. Forgive us of this cavalier attitude. Forgive us of our ignorance. But we are so blind, we are so easily misled. We so easily misunderstand. That this whole world is spiritual. The physical is spiritual, and the spiritual is physical. May you continue to teach us and show us that just because we are Christians doesn't mean we, we are only restricted to one or two things that we can do to be spiritual. That is false. Christians are not restricted to just one or two things to be spiritual. In fact, we have the whole creation. We have the whole world to show who you are, God. That is spirituality, true spirituality. So, Lord, we ask that you please forgive us. We ask that you please teach us how to live that out specifically in our context. First of all, we ask that you please help us to believe, to be convicted, to be convinced of your truth, of your word. Because honestly, God, if we do not believe it in our hearts, it doesn't matter what we do. We need to first believe it. We need first to be convinced and convicted in our own hearts first before we can even have any action, meaningful actions. So please, Holy Spirit, 
convict us, convince us, open our hearts, ears, and eyes. But we are easily blind and led astray by this world. We come before you and we ask that you please continue to let this soak within us, that uh, in everything we do in this world, in this life, it is for your glory, and it is our spiritual act of worship, as your word says in Romans 12. Present our bodies as a holy sacrifice. That is our spiritual worship. So we come before you, we ask you, please continue to teach us this, Lord, as we go through this process, as we continue to learn little by little and, um, and make mistakes. We ask you, please continue to teach us through that as well. That in all these things, Lord, that our, let our whole life be a spiritual act of worship, not just one or two things. So it is in, in light of this, Lord, we thank you and we surrender unto you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father.